Hello everyone, my name is Tim Wee and I would like to present to you a solution that I found to the three indistinguishable dice problem posted by Matt Parker, also known as Stand Up Matt. I'll put a link to the, uh, to the puzzle in the description, but I'm also going to describe the puzzle to you first. If you've already seen the puzzle, you can skip over this part. Now imagine you're playing a game that involves two dice. For example, Monopoly is the example that Matt gave. Uh, however, the only dice that you have is three dice, which are encased in a bigger uh, transparent dice. Um, I don't have such a dice, unfortunately, but just imagine. So you're only allowed to roll three dice at a time, and the dice must be indistinguishable. So you can't just, for example, paint one of them red and then say that we're just going to ignore the red one. That would work, but you're not allowed to do this. This is supposed to be a mathematical solution. Okay. Now, my solution, um, I came up with the solution yesterday after I saw Matt's video just two days ago. Unfortunately, Matt posted his solution yesterday already, so I'm a bit late to the game. But um, I'm still going to post this because I think that my solution is even easier than all of the, solution pre all of the solutions presented in the video. Um, my solution does not require any... Uh, mental arithmetic, it does not require any graphical visualization, it only requires the kind of things that first graders can do. In most other cases, you can literally, literally read the result of the dice. I am now going to um, use the method, I'm going to roll the dice several times and just tell you what the result is. This way, I hope I can prove to you that it is very easy to do because I can do it very quickly. But at the same time, maybe you can figure out the system yourself. And then at the, uh, at the end, you can see whether you were right. So let's get going. This is a 1 and a 2. This is a 5 and a 4. This is a 2 and a 1. This is a 4 and a 3. This is a six and another six, a pair of sixes. This is a one and a two. This is a one and a three. This is a six and a four. This is a four and a three. This is a pair of ones. A pair of ones. This is a one and a two. This, again, is a pair of ones. We've already had that. This is a six and a three. This is a six and a four. This is a six and a one. This is a five and a two. This is a three and a five. This is a five and a six. This is a 4 and a 1, and this is a 4 and a 3. I'm going to stop here because I've demonstrated enough. The only case that hasn't come up is 3 of the same, which would be a pair of 5s, no matter which number is tripled. Always a pair of 5s. Okay, now before I explain the details of my algorithm, I'm going to explain to you why I posted this. Well, all of the solutions posted by Matt either require uh, some graphical visualization. His favorite solution was one where you have to keep a hexagonal diagram in your head, use the three dice that you've rolled to create a triangle within that diagram, and then figure out which angle in the triangle is right angled. I find that exceedingly difficult to do in your head. And even if you have a printed hexagon, uh, that would help you, but my solution doesn't require that. Secondly, Another solution uh, that was mentioned in Matt's video is uh, this one, which is represented by this complicated flowchart. Now, I'm saying that this is complicated not because it has many cases, but because it has a lot of mathematics. For example, right at the start, you have to add the three values together and find the remainder modulo 6. You have to do that in all of the cases, no matter which numbers you rolled. And on top of that, in half of the cases when the result is even, you have to convert all the dice values to some other value and then work with the converted values in your head. So you cannot read the values directly off the dice. Matt Parker gave Monopoly as an example of a game that requires two dice. I think this is a bad example because 
uh, in Monopoly, you only need the sum of the two dice. It doesn't matter which values you roll. However, backgammon, which is this game here, does require the two values of the dice, even if the sum is the same. To give you an example, in this particular situation here, if I were to roll the dice as white, and if I were to roll a 3 and a 4, then white has no moves, and it is immediately black's turn. However, if white were to roll a 5 and a 2, white can, in fact, make a move, even though the sum is the same. On top of that, also in backgammon, uh, although most of the time the two dice are indistinguishable, so if you get a 5 and a 2, or a 2 and a 5, it's the same thing, there is one situation, which is at the beginning of every game, where the two dice actually need to be distinguishable. Each player rolls one dice, and it matters which dice belongs to which player. And it's, uh, the values also matter, because they constitute the first move. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to explain the details of my algorithm and hopefully convince you that it is extremely simple. Case number one is where all three are the same. This is always a pair of fives. That's all you have to remember, a pair of fives. If you have two of the same and one different, i.e. two of a kind, it's literally the two values that you see. So this would be a four and a three. And also if you have that, it's also a four and a three. Third case you have a 6 and two different values. If you have a 6 and two different values which are not also 6s, it's those two values. So in this case, it's the 1 and the 3. You can literally read it off. This is a 4 and a 3. This, since the 6 is duplicated, is the previous case, 6 and a 3. So this, even though it has a 6, would not be three, two 3s. It would be a 6 and a 3. Then we have the case where you have a 5 and two other numbers, but no 6s. This case splits up into two further cases. If the other two numbers, as in this case, are consecutive, have a dif difference of 1, 2 and 3, then you just use the lower one. So it's a 2, and this one becomes a 6. So this is a 2 and a 6. If those two are not consecutive, for example, it's a 2 and a 4, let's say, then it's the sum of those. So this would be a 6 and a 6, a pair of 6s. This would be a 6 and a 5. And finally, the last case is the one where you have no 5s, no 6s, and all dice different. In this case, there will always be one of the numbers 1 to 4 missing. The result is a pair of that. So this would be a pair of 2s. This would be a pair of 3s. This would be a pair of 4s. And, as you've probably already guessed, this would be a pair of 1s. That's it. You never need any calculation. Uh, you, you never need to do anything more than uh, what you learn in first grade. You never need to add more than single digit numbers. You never need to do any modulo, and you do not need to keep any diagrams in your head. Now, I have created a flowchart that represents this algorithm. At first glance, you, it appears as if it is more complicated than the one you see earlier, simply because it has more different cases, six different cases. However, it turns out that it's far easier to follow, not because it has uh, fewer or more cases, but because each one of the cases is extremely simple to do. You do not need any arithmetic or modulo. Also, you may have noticed the numbers in the blue circles. Uh, if you're a mathematician, you've probably already figured out what they are. They are the probabilities out of 36 of each of the cases coming up. The 5 and 5 case comes up only 1 in 36 cases. But you can see that the, case, the two cases where you can literally read off the values from the dice come up 25 out of 36 of the cases, which is 69% of the time, together with the 5 and 5, which is also trivial, at 72%. So the uh, case at the bottom, even if you feel that this is somewhat convoluted, uh, only comes up very rarely, and even then it is very simple to do. Now, finally, uh, I've created this um, diagram, this, this table, to show you that the probabilities do, in fact, match up. And you can also kind of see that the, uh, the values are distributed pretty regularly, especially the ones where you have uh, two of the same and one other. They, they fill, fill up this triangle in a completely logical fashion. Uh, the diagonal obviously has half the probability of all the others. That's why there is less in there. Now, even in the case where you need two distinguishable dice, all you need to do to, do to create that is just say, if you have two of the same, then you put them in ascending order. In every other case, descending order. It's as simple as that. This is my solution. Thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you again. My name is Tim Lee. Goodbye.